Long answer questions. Every exam board has them and a lot of students absolutely dread them. For AQA, it's 15 marks at the back of the A-level paper and that could be the difference between a grade. So in this video, I'm gonna talk you through the top tips of how to approach these questions to gain more marks and to convince you why you will actually love these questions rather than dread them. So let's get into my top tips. So let's start by going through what types of questions these could be. Typically, they test your knowledge, and that's one reason why you should love these questions over the rest. It is much, much easier to gain marks on questions that are testing your knowledge rather than application, maths, evaluation, critical analysis, and so on. So the types of command words that you typically get are define, describe, explain, compare, contrast. And I'll put just here what each of those command words mean. You often get a combination of the two, so it could be define and describe this, or define and explain, describe and explain, or compare and contrast. But all of those are testing your knowledge. So I have four top tips on how to gain the maximum amount of marks on these questions. Number one is bullet point your answers. That's right, you are allowed to bullet point your answers. It doesn't matter if your teacher tells you you can't, you can in the actual exam. For AQA, it doesn't say anywhere that you can't bullet point them except for the essay. It is the same for some other exam boards, but definitely double check in your spec and look at the mark scheme to double check. So bullet point your answers, it makes it so much quicker, prevents you from waffling, and that should mean that you get a better quality of answer. The second key point is for every one of your bullet points, underline what you think is the key marking point or phrase that is going to be getting you the mark on that mark scheme. This should help you again be more concise and improve your clarity of answer. Because if you're looking at your bullet point and you can't see what you think is a key marking point, you're gonna have to think of one and slot it in. My third top tip is, if it's a five mark question, put in six bullet points. Always give one extra bullet point than the question is worth. And that's so you've got like a backup insurance bullet point. Because you never know, one of the bullet points you wrote, maybe it didn't get you a mark, or maybe two of the bullet points actually together add it up to one mark. So always do one insurance bullet point. And my fourth tip, this one is specific to AQA. For AQA, the long answer questions are at the back of paper one. So what I suggest is go straight to the back and answer them first. And here's why. If you were to run out of time on the paper, you would miss those questions. And if you run out of time, it probably means you're spending a lot of time trying to work out some of the harder questions and maybe you weren't gaining very many marks. Whereas if you start on these long answer questions, which are testing your knowledge, assuming that you've revised thoroughly and you have that knowledge, you've got a high chance of banking a high number of marks, 10 to 15 marks straight away. And then go back to the beginning and work through the rest. Because otherwise, if you do run out of time, you're missing that opportunity to bank some easier marks. So definitely start at the back on that one. So the next thing then, we've got our top tips. You need to have practice. Practice is key. And I've made this easy for you. If you click the link in my description, you can download my assessment skills bundle completely for free. And that is a bundle of past paper questions sorted by skill. So find the one that says extended response and have a go at all of them. Spread it out over time, obviously, because it'll take a long time to do, but you should have a go at all of them to help you become familiar with how to answer them, the timing and the key marking points. Now, if you do need more help identifying the key marking points, then again, I'll link my flashcards in the description below. I've got for all of the A-level, every single key marking point that commonly comes up and the definition. So if you want that little cheat, definitely check out my flashcards. So for now, let's practice a couple that I have written myself based on my knowledge of the mark schemes. So you will have never seen these before. Grab yourself a pen and a bit of paper and let's have a go. So for each question, as it comes up, pause the video, you have a go, and then you can go through the answers with me. So here are two examples, and I'm also gonna show you two different options of how you could present these answers. So the first one is a six mark question. 
contrast how an optical microscope and a transmission electron microscope work and contrast the limitations of their use when studying cells. So the first thing I'd be doing in approaching this question is splitting my answer into those two different aspects you've been asked to include. The aspect of how they work and the other element was the limitations. So that's what these two bullet points are just here. So the sorts of things you could include for how they work is a beam of light is condensed to create the image for an optical microscope whereas a beam of electrons is condensed to create the image for an electron microscope. The second point, the beam of light in an optical microscope is focused using a glass lens, whereas the beam of electrons in an electron microscope is focused using electromagnets. So I've put whereas in capitals there. I wouldn't actually do that in the exam. That is for your benefit to know that in these types of questions where you have to compare or contrast, you need to have both statements within that one sentence to get the mark. So you need to say, it's this for optical microscopes, whereas it's that for electron microscopes. So if we then move on to the limitations, we can see that we have an optical microscope has a poorer resolution um, due to light having a longer wavelength, whereas an electron microscope has a higher resolving power or higher resolution as electrons have a shorter wavelength. Optical microscopes have a lower magnification um, and because you've said lower, that is already comparative. So you don't have to say lower, whereas electron has higher, lower is already indicating that. Optical microscopes can produce color images, whereas electron microscopes only produce black and white images. And lastly, optical microscopes, you can examine living samples, whereas with electron microscopes, because it has to be in a vacuum, you can only look and examine non-living or dead samples. Now, I did say you could also present these answers as a table. So it's the same question, but I wanted to demonstrate to you how you could present this as a table instead. And in the exam, you're not going to make a neat table like this, but it's just to give you a general idea how I've split it. We've got one column for the optical microscope, the other columns for the electron microscope, and then I've still split it into those two subsections, how they work and the limitations. So it's the same information as I just showed you, but this time, instead of having it as comparative sentences, this is how I've done it in a table. So the key thing would be, instead of saying um, you have this for an optical microscope, whereas you have that for an electron, you need to make sure that for those comparative statements, they're on the same row of your table, and that way you are demonstrating them as contrasting points. So that's how you could present it as a table. And for AQA, you can do that for any question except the essay. Same with the bullet points, any question except for the essay. So let's have a go at this question here. Describe the polymer and monomer structure of DNA. And this time it is a five mark question. So I'm going to bullet point my answers and I'm going to do it as number bullet points just so I can definitely make sure I've got at least five. So the first thing I'm going to do is names of the key fact. So polymer is made of nucleotides. I've demonstrated my knowledge there of what the nucleotide is inside of this monomer. So nucleotide is made up of deoxyribose, phosphate group and nitrogenous bases. So that is me describing the monomer structure. Then I need to get on to describing the polymer structure, which we've partly done because we've said the polymer is made of nucleotides. But now we need to describe how those nucleotides are arranged and held together. So that's why for mark number three, I've gone for phosphodiester bonds are going to form between those nucleotides and that's what makes the polymer structure. Then for DNA specifically, the polymer always exists as two strands and those two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. And then talking about where those hydrogen bonds form, linking it to the complementary base pairs is also what I'm going to include. So knowing that the hydrogen bonds will form between adenine and thymine, so those are your complementary base pairs, and between cytosine and guanine, which are the other complementary base pairs. So that's it. Now you know how to get full marks on these questions. You've practiced a few with me. Go and have a go at practicing the rest from that free bundle. If you are new here, then don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on my monthly videos that are practicing exam technique. But also I have other videos I upload every week to help you to get that A star in biology. But for now, I'll link in some of my previous videos on application skills that will really, really help you.